a peculiar mix of structures left derelict in a Parisian park. There seems to be no rhyme or reason to it. It's all just smashed together in the same spot. And that's part of the wonder and mystery of this place. A watery graveyard forgotten by time, the silent protector of an English village. This isn't just one old rowing boat tossed aside. These things dominate the landscape. A network of relics forged through deception on a grand scale. Audacious doesn't cover it. You had a team of a 1,000 overseers watching to make sure they adhered to the rules. And if they were caught breaking those rules, it could have started another war. And a site on America's east coast harboring vast secrets. Inside, you're presented with this large, cavernous void. And then as you venture deeper, you see these rusting elements that suggest that something hefty was being hoisted or lifted up and down here. Decaying relics, ruins of lost worlds, forged through years of toil, now haunted by the past. Their secrets waiting to be revealed. Paris, France, the city of light. Gay Paris, it's a proper metropolis, a real melting pot for cultures around the world. Liberty, equality, and brotherhood. It's really a particular vision of human democracy, of equality, that really resonates in France. But on the outskirts of the city are a series of crumbling structures that don't seem to belong. You have this park that combines some features of seemingly faraway cultures. There are facets of architecture that look like they've been airlifted from around the world. Vietnam, Tonga, China. There's a bridge there that looks vaguely Japanese, appropriately surrounded by bamboo. Alone, each of these things are really beautiful but they're smashed together rather curiously. The items in this collection are relics of a past that Parisians would rather forget. You wonder when they're brought together what they mean, what they were used for, and why they were placed in juxtaposition. The story begins at the dawn of the 20th century with the opening of a garden. In 1899, the French government decided to open a garden with a greenhouse to grow exotic plants. Catherine O'Dare has studied the garden's dark secrets. In the greenhouse, uh, you had plants such like cocoa beans or coffee beans or vanilla beans. But this wasn't just an ordinary greenhouse growing garden tomatoes. This was an institution of scientific study. And where were all these plants coming from? The French colonies. In the 19th century, France had an empire that stretched across 8% of the world's surface. Alongside England and Germany, France has colonies that really are all over the globe. You have French colonies in the Caribbean, you have a French colony in South America. You have them in Asia and in Africa, North Africa and West Africa. The 19th and 20th centuries were a time of rapid discovery, and the major global powers competed for scientific superiority. So the work that these French experts were doing here has real potential. And any new commodities that they discover can then be processed and redistributed across the empire. But all that doesn't explain these buildings. For seven years, French botanists studied the samples gathered from the colonies. But by 1906, the garden was broke. 
this garden needed some cash. The ordinary French population just didn't seem that interested in the work that was being done here, even though it was very, very important work. They needed to get the French people excited about the colonies and their products again. To raise capital for the garden, they decided to stage a grand exhibition. At its center were new buildings inspired by the colonies. Imagine a turn of the century Disneyland. So you are going to see the Orient right next to the African jungle. And it was a huge hit. Thousands of visitors came, and they even got the president of the French Republic to come and check it out. The samples of architecture in uh, this garden were French Guiana, from Indochina, from Tunisia, Morocco, Madagascar. The noise would have been incredible, from music to squawking animals and the hubbub of people. And there would have been a cocktail of rich odors, from spices to camel excrement. This was quite an exhibition. The rarest treasures from the colonies were on display. There was nothing you couldn't see here, including human beings. Mongolians, Chinese, Africans, they would have been presented in what would have been considered representative indigenous wear, clothing that may or may not have had ceremonial purposes, but they would be presented sort of as exotics in dress and in speech and in behavior. It was meant to be a cultural exchange, but the exchange was in one direction, with people who were on display being gawked at, almost like being in a zoo. The owners of the garden hoped to make big money from their exhibits. History had taught them that the human zoo could draw a crowd. These type of colonial exhibitions or human zoos, if you will, were not limited to, to France. You had similar examples in terms of England, in terms of the United States. London, Berlin, even New York put human beings on display. High-minded scientists would come and perform a systematic study of non-Caucasian people to try to classify the differences. But the conclusions they came to, today, they would be considered extremely racist. To raise enough capital for the garden, they needed the most eye-catching displays from France's most distant colonies. There were adventurers who would travel to the four corners of the French Empire, and they would offer to pay these people handsomely if they would come to France and talk to French people about their culture. The recruiters offered things like a percentage of ticket sales, but that often never materialized. And the vast majority of these people didn't speak any French, so they were completely at the whim of the adventurers that had brought them there. The colonial exhibition of 1907 raised thousands of dollars for the garden, ensuring its future. But a global crisis less than 10 years later would see the garden put to a different purpose. So during the First World War, the garden was converted into a war hospital because the people from uh, the French colonies were brought here to fight for France on the French Western Front. France's colonial subjects were recruited by the hundreds of thousands to fight on the side of their own colonizers. Buildings that used to be exhibition spaces or ticket halls were now things like surgeries for France's foreign and native soldiers. They even built Paris's first mosque for Muslim colonial troops. And you'd think that this would be some type of watershed moment. Now that these people had fought for France, that they'd get recognition, if not as equals, then at least more respect than being put on display. But you'd be wrong. Over a decade after French and colonial soldiers fought as brothers in arms, France threw their biggest colonial exhibition ever. For this 1931 exhibition, there are some 32 million tickets sold over six months. 
There was even an entire nomadic tribe of people from Senegal. You have to wonder how they were convinced to participate in such. This would be the last time this kind of display was seen in France. The colonial exhibitions soon went out of fashion. The park was again closed to the public and the buildings left to rot in this quiet corner of Paris. Today, historians like Catherine dedicate their work to recording the history of the colonial era. So today, the garden is uh, partly abandoned. It became very important in 2005 to reopen the garden to the public. Although these exhibitions end, the legacies of colonialism has a very, very long afterlife. But that idea somehow, that allure, uh, that exoticism still persists. And we should blame at least part of that on the history of putting people on display. Standing in the waters off the New Jersey coastline is Sandy Hook, a sandbar littered with the remnants of war. Looking around Sandy Hook today, it's like a kind of a yard sale of military technology. Some look like very typical Cold War era installations. Others look as though they date back as far as the Civil War. The assortment of structures and weapons on show here makes you wonder, is this your typical military base or something entirely different? The site's position seems to offer the first clue as to its purpose. This long, narrow peninsula points like a dagger right at New York Harbor. And this hints at its strategic importance because any deep draft vessel approaching New York Harbor is gonna have to swing right by this peninsula. Yet, this wasn't a place with just one role to play or one story to tell. I see construction from times when America was just another colony. Parts that show America's rise to military superiority. I see evidence of the moment when the United States stopped being just another country and became the military colossus it is. Here it is, on this little sandy bit of ground. Towards the northern end of the peninsula, an old lighthouse provides a commanding view across this baffling complex and hints at its beginnings. The construction of this lighthouse points to Sandy Hill's significance in American history, dating all the way back to the mid-1700s. Its need was driven by New York's merchant traffic. This is a harbor that has been strategically important to anyone trying to hold the North Atlantic. It was an important Dutch, English, and American harbor. And when you look at that lighthouse, it shows how long people have needed to navigate safely in and out of New York. Park ranger Tom Hoffman knows the danger of these shores better than most. Even on a clear day, Sandy Hook is so low and flat, it blends in with the ocean water. And imagine that's the daytime, and at nighttime, you don't see anything. The night they lighted it for the first time was June 11, 1764. And it's been standing here on this location ever since. But these ruins show the treacherous coastline wasn't the only danger here. The story of war written across this place actually began at the lighthouse, when the British hoped to defend this vital navigational aid during the American Revolution. The British 
dispatched two frigates and anchored them right out here and had an armed guard here. And sure enough, who shows up but 200 American soldiers with two cannon in 1776. They're sneaking up the hook. The commanding officer ordered the cannons to fire at the lighthouse. But as he put it in a report, we bombarded the tower for over an hour, but could make no impression. Continuing to shine for centuries to come, the lighthouse would oversee a dramatic transformation of this land. In 1874, nearly a decade after the Civil War ended, thunderous shots rang out over Sandy Hook, fired from this now silent platform. A now united nation was wary of external threats. This empty landscape had become the US Army's first proving ground. A proving ground is a place where you can take a new design and where you can take samples of all of your military production and you can prove them. They would check to make sure that the rounds worked, the fuses worked, the range accuracy, the detonation, the explosion. They would test every aspect of the projectile and the gun firing it. And so you needed a place where you could fire freely without risk to you know, civilian life. Over the coming half century, hundreds of thousands of rounds would be fired from the Sandy Hook Proving Ground. And some of the largest, most ambitious weapons ever created were tested here. Yet, as some of the structures here testify, this site was about more than simply testing weapons or helping ships navigate these waters. What if the fight came to Sandy Hook and America's own shores? We were talking about the two big stories of Sandy Hook. One's the lighthouse, and uh, that will guide any ship from around the world into New York Harbor. But in times of war, you have to have some kind of defense to stop enemy warships from coming in. In the mid-1890s, war with Spain appeared inevitable. So more emphasis was put on nearby defensive structures like Fort Hancock. The U.S. did not have the capacity at the end of the 19th century to build a big enough navy. So instead of building a lot of ships, the United States builds a lot of batteries of guns to defend all of its major harbors. What you had here were four 12-inch caliber mortars. And you could see their bases had been circular that's because a mortar fires projectiles high up to come back down on your enemy ships. As a proving ground for the military and with access to the latest technology, Sandy Hook was set as an example to follow. The decision is taken in the United States to protect every valuable harbor with these shore batteries. And so breech loading eight, 10 and 12 inch naval guns are delivered to forts like Hancock starting in 1895 to defend America's harbors. While the Spanish never came within range, other enemies would soon threaten these shores. And while the US had always trailed the European powers in military might, here at Fort Hancock, that old dynamic was shifting. European gun makers are developing artillery pieces that can shoot smokeless powder, fire quickly, disappear, and Sandy Hook is where the American versions of these guns are being developed. Here is where American technology is keeping up thanks to US government research. This is the, uh, the very first and only steam-powered uh, disappearing gun battery. So you load the guns while inside, then it lifted up through openings in the roof to fire at enemy ships out in the ocean. And of course, once you fire, now you've got to reload. So the gun comes back down on the elevator, and it's a disappearing gun. Within a few years of being completed, however, this battery was already outdated. But the race to keep ahead was still on. In 1918, a U-boat reportedly fired 16 shots at Fort Hancock, and the guns that stood here responded in kind. 
the German submarines were a sign that times were changing. The two big threats to American ports in World War II were enemy bombers and enemy submarines. And those big coastal gun emplacements designed to defend American port facilities were no longer as important. What remains is a legacy of both the history of this site and the route America took on its journey to the modern era. By the 1950s, Sandy Hook entered its final chapter. We're walking in the last defense system used by the US Army here at Fort Hancock, the uh, Nike Air Defense Radar Site, designed to shoot down Russian bombers if the Cold War went hot. Once Russians have atomic weapons, then everyone in America instantly understands that American cities are immensely vulnerable to Russian attack. After more than a century defending New York from the sea, attention now shifted to the skies and the gravest threat the US ever faced. For hundreds of years, Sandy Hook's military installations had helped protect the waters around New York. But by the 1950s, they were also defending the city from the air. Nike batteries were part of the US Army Air Defense Command. These were placed strategically near cities across the country to prevent the destruction of the centers of America's great retaliatory and productive might. The Nike positions around New York City are designed to stop another Pearl Harbor-style sneak attack. So we just went under one of the platforms that held the missile tracking radar because the missiles were a mile south of us. And once you launched the missile, the radar here guided the missile up to the target. And then another radar, the target tracking radar, was tracking the target and through a computer system brought the two together and guaranteed a hit. Yet, like all the weapons and defense systems on show here, its lifespan was short. In 1974, with the Nike missile program outdated, the last of the equipment and military personnel left the peninsula. Left to the elements on this windswept coastline, what remains here paints a picture not just of the story of this site, but of the birth and history of a nation. All of these artifacts taken together reflect America's rise to world power, from this vulnerable colony of the British Empire to a nation that then projects power and then has the latest cutting edge technology to defend the free world against the communist threat. It's all right here on Sandy Hook. Southern England, in a quiet village called Purton, lying beside a mighty river, is a fleet of the dead. They certainly look like boats, but they appear to be made of stone. Can you make boats of stone? Are they statues? These monoliths stand half submerged in Britain's longest river, the Severn. Some of these boats, you can only see the very tip of their rotting bow just poking out from the ground. They draw a line one and a half miles along the shoreline. There are so many of them, but they definitely all seem to have been there for a while. It's almost as if they've been put here for a purpose, as if it's been designed, but yet they're completely enveloped by the land. The river and a much calmer body of water next to it, both connect the village of Purton to the rest of England. You have a major river right next to the canal. I mean, talk about belt and braces. Why would you need both? 
Nearly 50 years ago, a young boy and his family came to this riverbank in southern England. When I came here as a child, this was a great place to play. Paul Barnett and his father found strange shapes sticking out of the mud. But they had no idea what they were. Well, my father being an ex-sailor, he had his own curious sort of observations as to what this may be, and he just naturally assumed it was just a great and easy place to get rid of vessels. We didn't know. We really didn't know. The secrets of the site and its boats made of stone would remain buried until Paul returned to solve the mystery 20 years later. Well, the first thing that I chose to do was to carry out a research project, a local archive. The information held therein was very sparse. I was absolutely astounded by the lack of information. These things dominate the landscape. You would have thought that if they had been put here for a reason, that there would be an official record. But the archives were empty. Paul's investigation had hit a wall. But a clue would be found in the River Severn's storied past. Although it may not look it, this is an immensely dangerous area. Nobody to venture out into the River Severn. It's incredibly treacherous. The tide itself actually runs in at about 13 knots. The River Severn is deadly, but next door is a more placid body of water. Directly next door to this powerful river is a canal. 200 years ago, canals like these were the main ways of moving freight around Britain. And people came to rely on these. These canals were the arteries for moving goods around Britain, including here at Purton. The Sharpness Canal opened in 1827. The people of Purton were now connected to the rest of England. But less than 100 years later, the canal's existence was under threat. The canal, a major piece of infrastructure for trade, is protected from this very dangerous river by a very narrow mound of dirt. That mound, in some places just 20 feet thick, is all that keeps these two bodies of water separate. With the full force of the river coming in, it was hitting the bank, and as a result of which, it was now prone to erosion, which was happening almost on a daily basis. The riverbank literally holds back the tide. Without it, the river would consume the canal. For nearly a century, the canal and the river coexisted in harmony. But in 1909, that harmony was shattered. A massive storm hit the southwest of England, and the River Severn began to overflow and spill over into the canal. The full force of that storm came into the bank Approximately 60 metres of it was removed, one hit, and it was swept away by the River Severn and its fast-flowing waters. Tons and tons of dirt and silt were carried away downstream. Nearly 200 feet of the bank was swept away. The canal was now in real danger of breaching. Something had to be done. The storm almost obliterated the riverbank but a fleet made of stone was about to change it forever. They had no money for big restoration projects. This was a very small part of Britain that had very limited means and very little time. But the chief engineer for the canal had a radical plan. The engineer for the dock company made a request. Are there any barges that could be brought to this point, run out to the foreshore and add their strength in order to protect that waterway? For the plan to work, they needed a whole fleet of boats. So they asked the locals to volunteer their old tugs, and they rallied to the cause. In total, 15 wooden vessels were brought to Purton. This was actually one of the first vessels, in actual fact, the first vessel to be beached here. 20 minutes before high tide, the vessel with a full head of steam would come thundering into the bank. The plan was to then drill holes in them to let water in. This would allow silt and mud from upstream to come down, then fill into the boats and around the boats and effectively rebuild the riverbank. The barges were beached on the riverbank, protecting the canal from the Severn. 
they became known as the Purton Hulks. It appeared the canal had been saved, but the celebration was short-lived. The one thing about wood is that it rots. What was happening was the timber lighters were now rotting, and as a result, they, once again, the canal was in danger. So wooden boats rot and metal boats rust. Fortunately, history provided the answer. In the years after World War I, the price of timber and iron rose sharply. It became too expensive to make riverboats. So boat makers turned to an unlikely material. The concrete boats could be made really fast and really cheap, but apparently they were a nightmare to drive. Old concrete barges were the solution to protecting the riverbank permanently. In the 1960s, eight were brought to Purton, the final Purton hulks. 60 years later, the bank's thickness has doubled. The canal was saved. Knowing how uh, you can work with the sea, you can't work against her. Absolutely astounded by the real seamanship that would have taken to get these vessels in here. The Purton hulks now stand as silent guardians made of wood and stone. For the last 60 years, they've been there, protecting the canal from the powerful River Severn. A testament to engineering by the seat of your pants. In a remote region of Western Poland, an engineering giant is hidden in plain sight. When you approach this site, it really doesn't look like much. And then as you get closer, you see that there are pillboxes dotted around the landscape. Once you've spotted one, you then see another. And as your eye carries on, you realize this line goes on almost forever. This is a really major piece of engineering. So it reminds me of the Maginot Line in France. But we're not in France, so it couldn't be that. These pillboxes draw an outline of a fortress buried underground. There is an immense network of tunnels that seems to go on just forever. And in one of them, there's a railway line. People worked here, and then they left. But they left some clues as to what they were doing down there. A room with a sign above it that says machine and round, machine room. This is a place where clearly an immense engineering effort went in, but ultimately it came to naught. Almost 22 miles of tunnels are buried in the Polish countryside. But a clue on the surface points to a history of deception. There's this one above ground feature, this odd bridge. That's the key to understanding the structure. What secrets are buried beneath the surface? A mammoth engineering project spanning nearly 40 miles stretches across and under the Polish countryside. Most of the site is underground. There's miles and miles of tunnel, the train tracks. But the clue to what the site is about is right here in this one above ground part of it, the bridge, a bridge with an odd hinge on it. Historian and architect Robert Jurger has spent his career exploring one of Poland's most overlooked historical sites. The plan of this bridge is still protected by the patent that's kept in Berlin. The level of security was so high that the operators consisted of a specially trained group of soldiers. Swing bridges are common on major rivers to let large ships pass through. But the water here is practically a trickle. The swing bridge is here because this entire set of fortifications is actually illegal. In Western Poland, just 40 miles from the German border, a swinging bridge was part of an illegal fortification program. The origins of this structure date to the end of the First World War, 
when this part of Poland belonged to Germany. But think back to what happened to Germany at the end of World War I. They were defeated by a big allied coalition. They were disarmed. They lost territory. They lost citizens to the Treaty of Versailles. The treaty was punishing to Germany. They had to give up their entire empire. Uh, they had to allow the Allies to occupy part of their industrial heartland. And they also had to limit their army to 100,000 men. Germany was also forbidden from building any new fortifications along its border, leaving the country virtually defenseless. The Germans felt a great sense of vulnerability about their border, because after World War I, they were a universally loathed nation, but they had enemies on their right. There was Poland, and behind Poland, of course, the Soviet Union. With limited defenses, Germany was vulnerable to invasion from the east. Its biggest weakness was a stretch of land sandwiched between two rivers. This region was flat and had no natural barriers. It was a highway that led straight to Berlin. If the Poles or the Soviets wanted to invade Germany, that was a perfect route because it gave them a direct path to Berlin, the capital. This was a huge hole in Germany's defenses, and they wanted to plug it. But with the treaty making the construction of new defenses illegal, the German government concocted a ruse. The rules of the Treaty of Versailles limited Germany's spending on the military and on fortifications, but it didn't say anything about water management. So they brought in engineers and dug up hundreds and hundreds of tons of earth, redirected rivers, and essentially created a new natural barrier. The main tool against the tanks was water. Many tactical canals were built, and they became the main barrier against the enemy's tanks. On those channels, they built a line of tactical bridges. A series of bridges across an artificial waterway each with a mechanism to stop an enemy advance. Those bridges were closed in case of the arrival of the enemy, and in normal times were used by the civilians. Over five years, a line is drawn between the Varta and Ordea rivers. This is the beginning of the Ostval. Audacious doesn't cover it. You had a team of a 1,000 overseers watching to make sure Germany adhered to the rules. And if they were caught breaking those rules, it could have started another war. An emboldened German government began to add tunnels and bunkers, making the Ostfahl a state-of-the-art battle fortress. But in 1938, Germany's leader came to inspect it. He was not happy. When Hitler visits the Ostwall in 1938, he is definitely underwhelmed. Hitler is somebody who wants to see, you know, parades of panzers in the street, flyovers by Luftwaffe bombers, dive bombers, and fighter planes, goose-stepping infantry. He does not want to see these subterranean fortresses with just a little machine gun turret poking out of the pine trees. The Ostwall failed its inspection, and its construction was put on hold. The following year, Hitler marched his troops past the wall and into Poland. Once Germany had conquered Poland, this fortification lay in the middle of German-controlled territory, so it was militarily useless. After a decade of pouring so much effort and money into this line, it was left as a lame duck. This speaks to Hitler's conception of warfare, that the German army had to be on the move, it had to be attacking, and that it was not going to sit passively behind fortifications. With the Ostwald cancelled, the tunnels were left empty, until the Fuhrer found a new use for them. After Hitler stopped construction on the Ostwald, it was largely unused. But when the Allies begin their strategic bombing of Germany, it finds a new purpose. They move machinery down here to build aircraft engines. With most able-bodied soldiers fighting on the front lines, 
only a small regiment was left to defend the wall. Regular troops weren't stationed there, you just had militia, which were mostly uh, poorly trained Hitler youth and men too old to be sent to the front lines. Conditions were dreadful. It was dank, it was dark, it was underfunded, there were no resources. The people who were here really had been forgotten about. Remember, the front line was hundreds of miles away until everything changed. By the end of 1944, the Germans were being pushed back and the Soviets were creeping closer to Berlin. So Hitler was not, by any stretch of the imagination, a military genius. And he insisted on this tactic of no retreat. And what happens is hundreds of thousands of German troops are surrounded and captured by the Red Army until one of the last things in between the Soviet war machine and Berlin is this one bit of fortification. The Ostwahl and those defending it were about to be put to the test. The enemy was approaching from that side, approaching slowly. Firstly, he had to overpass the anti-tank barrier on the road. So these Hitler youth and these old guys manning the militia, they stand no chance against the Soviet army. But that doesn't stop them. They put up resistance, and they were determined to defend the border and defend this fortification. In just days, the wall was breached, and the Red Army rolled towards Berlin. The slightly pathetic thing about the line, really, is that after so much deviousness, so much planning, so much hopes for it, when the time actually came, they weren't prepared to put the manpower or the resources into using it, and the lame duck became a damp squib. Had this fortification been completed the way it was designed, most likely it would have been very precious to the German army. Unfortunately for them, they completed it only to 30%. And without anti-tank weaponry, the soldiers didn't have a chance against the power of the Soviet army. When the war ended and the treaties are signed, the borders are redrawn, and this area ends up inside Poland the very nation it was built to keep out. Now, the Ostwahl lies empty. Rumors speak of Nazi treasure still hidden in the walls. But all that fills the dark corridors today are some 35,000 protected bats. Abandoned, disintegrating, reclaimed by nature. Structures once at the cutting edge, bearing witness to the forces, pioneers, and villains that define the world today. Emblems of a shared past, standing in our present. <laughs> <laughs>